It's the canary in the mine, an early warning, a sign of a looming disaster. So said the head of the organisation, which represents NHS Hospital Trusts, on this programme yesterday. He was speaking about the health service's record deficit and the fact that the vast majority of hospitals will not be able to balance their books this year. Hospitals in England, that is. Many NHS insiders believe the system will soon simply be unable to cope with the pressures on it, even with the promises of year-on-year increases in spending. Well, the man who used to run the NHS in England, the chief executive, until 2014, was Sir David Nicholson, and he joins us now on the line. Good morning to you, Sir David. Good morning, Nick. Should these figures be seen as a wake-up call? Um, I think these figures have been coming for some time. Um, Before the election, we knew that there were serious financial problems affecting the NHS, and if they weren't addressed, um, they would get worse. And the figures that we have, I think it's just over £2.4 in terms of the provider deficit. That's probably an underestimation. We probably think that the real underlying deficit is about £3 And that's really important, not just for in terms of looking at what it looks like for last year. But that three billion problem will roll into this year, into 1617. So it creates a serious problem for hospitals and provider organisations. And yet year in, year out, we hear of problems that Treasury finds a little bit of money behind the sofa. Is this one of those years in which a little bit of extra cash will get us out of the problem or is something more fundamental going on? I think what's fundamentally changed here is that right up to 2008-2009, on average, the NHS got about 4.5% growth every year from 1948. Sometimes it got a bit more, sometimes it got a bit less, but that was generally the position. Since 2008-2009, with the financial crash and austerity, the NHS has essentially got little or no growth during that period. And there isn't a healthcare system, I don't think, in the developed world that can cope in the long term with little or no growth. Even though the government have given um, about 2% increase over the next five years, that's half of what the long term uh, would be. And in those circumstances, it creates a serious problem for the NHS. Not that it'll fall over, but what will happen is the pressure will get greater, the pressure on our staff gets greater and greater, waiting times will start to get longer, and people will start to take short-term action, which will be in the long-term detriment for the service. Such as? Um, Well, one of the things that uh, people will do is that they will uh, let waiting times uh, run out. And my experience of having worked through the process of delivering the 18-week guarantee is that it takes two-thirds of the GDP of the country to get you to a shorter waiting time. You can let it run out. Um, you, You save very little. But actually, you then have to spend huge amounts to get it back into place. So you essentially have patients waiting for longer, getting less of a service. You have workers working for less money over time and working harder. Now, the answer to all of this was meant to be efficiency. When you were in charge, it was called the Nicholson Challenge, wasn't it? The idea that billions could be released, not merely from so-called efficiencies from paperclips, but by reorganising the NHS, closing services, taking on popular decisions to centralise... Is that not the answer? I think one of the things I would say is the pressures facing the NHS at the moment are the same pressures that are affecting almost any healthcare system in the developed world. So whether you're in France, Germany, Sweden, Denmark, all of these countries are suffering the same kinds of challenges. And the answer to that most people are doing are threefold. First of all, they're thinking about how can we get patients and people to take more control over their own health and their own health care, using technology to enable them to do that. People are investing heavily in primary care. And thirdly, they are changing the way in which hospital services are delivered. The first two, generally speaking, get lots of support and a lot of, lot of uh, uh, acclamation. The third one is much, is much more complicated and much more difficult to do. Well, Chris Hobson, who uh, runs NHS providers, uh, he was on the programme yesterday, we were quoting him, he argues in The Times today, asked this question, does it make sense to keep open two A&E departments only 14 miles apart when they're so poorly staffed? In other words, is it time to start making closures which will be desperately unpopular locally? Do you think it is time? 
Well, there is no, no doubt in, in my mind, if you look at other countries, Germany, Denmark, France, they're all trying to reduce the size of the investment in secondary care, in hospital services. They're all trying to shift resources into primary and community care. And similarly, you need to do that here. And as I say, that Just spell that if you would, because even the, even okay. the language of seven secondary Sorry. care, it can, yeah. uh, can confuse Hospitals. people. You are saying to people listening to this programme, are you, you are going to have to accept that it might be sensible, it may be good, to close your local accident emergency, to merge as many local hospital services, tough, that is the way to get a better NHS. I think the thing I would say about that is that those kinds of things have been happening over the years anyway. Um, what we need is an acceleration of that. So if you look at things like stroke services, we've seen that reducing the number of uh, organisations that provide stroke services, concentrating the expertise in a smaller group of hospitals significantly improves outcomes for patients. If you look at major, major trauma services where we've concentrated and centralised them in a smaller number of hospitals, we've improved um, the survivorship of those individual patients. And I think we need to accelerate that. And indeed, what's happening at the moment in the NHS is people are exploring these issues as part of a service transformation plan. And does the that have for to me be centralised? Because the vogue, the fashion, is to push these decisions down, to have them taken more locally. Arguably, they'll never be taken locally because they'll always be unpopular. And it does take someone at the centre to say... It is tough to say, but these are more efficient and better if they're centralised, and we're going to just take those decisions for you. Yeah, I mean, the last uh, time I appeared on this programme was during the election campaign, when I was really concerned that these kinds of decisions were going to have to be taken during this parliament, but no-one wants to talk about it, either the Labour Party or the Conservative Party, at that moment in time. And people locally can get on and do things, but they need to, an environment created where the public start to understand the need to change services in order to create a high-quality, sustainable healthcare system for the NHS. I'm giving the opportunity i guess you don't you're not a politician we're not on the eve of an election put it as in as unpopular way as you can what is it that the country now has to be prepared to face up to if we are not merely to have patients getting worse services and nhs workers having a worse less well rewarded life okay the first thing is that we're going to have to spend more, more money on health care through the taxation system. It's either a choice of priorities for a government or it's increased taxes. There seems to me, when you look around the world, what people are doing in other countries, it's the only option available. So we need to increase the amount of money we spend on, on health care. And on services? Secondly, secondly, we need to change the way we deliver services. People, fewer people need to be admitted to hospital. And we need to create service in the community that can prevent... Uh, admission to hospital um, and we need to make sure that those who are in hospital get out of hospital as fast as, po as possible. That means smaller hospitals and smaller investment in secondary in hospital care. A final one, you tweeted during the junior doctors dispute, which looks like it might end. Of course, uh, junior doctors may reject the uh, agreed contract in a ballot soon. You said the imposition of the junior doctors contract and no emergency cover is a catastrophe so large for the NHS you can see it from space. How bad is morale in the NHS and whose fault is it? Well... One of the things that I, I would say, when I started in the NHS in the mid-70s, my boss said to me, anything that good happens in the NHS will be down to doctors and nurses, anything bad that happens in the NHS will be your fault and morale has never been lower. So there is something about that even, even, even today. What I would say about the junior doctors' uh, uh, dispute is that um, this is a generation of doctors who will recreate the NHS. They are different to the doctors of the, of the past. They're more skilled. They want to work more flexibly. They want more control over their, their, own, their, own, their own lives. The NHS needs to adapt to that and encourage and support them. And it seemed to me that the way the conversation was going, that that was not going to happen. And I was really worried that it was less to do with... Um, uh, uh, the, the issues around that particular uh, problem and more to do a general idea that somehow we needed to put the junior doctors in their place, which seemed to me completely the wrong place the, to be. The health secretary got it wrong. Um, well, the health secretary is not the only person involved in the negotiation of, uh, of, of junior, uh, junior doctors at hours. Um, uh, but you. clearly the government overall got it wrong. Sir David Nicholson, thank you very much.